bacteria. We can't live with them and we can't live without them. But I've seen a real shift in the last, oh, 10, 20 years from, ooh, gross, bacteria to bacteria. Some are good, some are bad. And they really run the gamut. What they lack in panache in terms of their appearance, uh, as I've drawn little chains of them up here, they really make up for some unique abilities in terms of their chemistry. And that's what we'll focus in this lecture. Right, as a reminder, bacteria are right here in their own domain. And you're probably not familiar with a lot of them, but you've heard of a few of them, like strep and staph and E. coli. These are usually abbreviated scientific names, but they're not as familiar as dogs and cats for sure. Where do bacteria live? Where don't they live? It is astounding how many places you can find bacteria. Not only are they super abundant in the soil, but they live inside of plant leaves, inside of plant roots. They live in the clouds. They float around on the air. Uh, they live on snow. They're at the bottom of the ocean. They are deep into the earth. People have recently drilled down. I think it was over a kilometer into the ground and found bacteria growing there. Even in oil deposits, bacteria are down there gobbling up oil. That's pretty amazing. Now in terms of us personally, we are not alone, that's to be sure. We think of ourselves as one species, human beings, homo sapiens. But you know, in your intestines alone, there may be up to a thousand species of bacteria. Probably second to your large intestine would be your mouth in terms of number of species of bacteria. It's a menagerie in there. It's crazy. And then your skin has lots of bacteria on them as well. None of this is a bad thing. Sometimes bacteria populations get out of control and then you know it's a problem, like when you have an infection on a cut or something going wrong in your intestines uh, that causes a lot of discomfort or gas or something, then bacteria become a problem. But most of the time, they're just there camping out, doing us no harm, and even doing us a fair bit of good. To give you an idea of how abundant they are just in soil, take a look at this bunch of bacterial plates. When we grow bacteria, we grow them on these petri dishes full of a gel with all the nutrients they need. And a lot of times we dilute them. So here's a sample of soil bacteria. This first plate has been diluted 100 times. And we're seeing it just coated with bacteria. So the next one was diluted 1,000 times. 10,000, 100,000, finally a million times on this last plate, but we're still seeing bacterial growth here, indicating that bacteria are really abundant in soil, enough that if we diluted a million times, they still show up. Now these colonies, let's look at this bottom plate here to know what is that colony? What are these little dots on the plates up here? That colony is from one cell multiplying. So it grows and grows and grows um, and, and divides enough where you can see it. Because remember, bacteria are too small to be seen, even with pretty high magnification under a microscope. In this case, E. coli bacteria have grown up just overnight. So they've been spread out on this plate by wiping them there. And each dot you see is the result of one cell multiplying enough where you can see it with the naked eye really astounding growth. In terms of the structure of bacteria, pretty simple. They're just single cells and super small ones at that, about 10 times smaller than our own cells. They're prokaryotic cells surrounded by a unique cell wall. Looking at bacteria from the outside, we notice that they come in a few different shapes, but all of those are really tiny. So from here to here is about the width of a human hair. So we're looking at a really small scale, but they look like these little spheres. We see a electron microscope image above, or these rods, same sort of thing, or, or even these little squiggles. And here we see some, these little purple guys, next to human red blood cells, which are among the smallest cells in the human body. So not a lot of variation in terms of their shape, and they're really small. To give you maybe some additional perspective over here, this is a cell scraped out from a human cheek. So just one of our epithelial cells 
Here's the nucleus in pink in the middle. And then all those purple dots are bacteria. So quite a bit smaller than our own. They also occur sometimes in chains like you see over here. So they're not always just scattered about individually, even though we think of them as unicellular. Well, that's their external structure. What about inside? What do they look like there? Many of the features that bacteria have are the same as any other cell, like the plasma membrane, that green layer that you see around the cell, the cytoplasm, all the goo inside, which includes ribosomes for making proteins, and a few other things. But some of the unique features of bacteria, let's go on to those. So one unique feature is how they house their DNA in this nucleoid region. So instead of surrounding it in a membrane like we do, theirs just sits in the middle of the cell. That's because they're prokaryotic. They don't have a true nucleus. So that's one unique feature. It makes life a little simpler for them. Another one is their cell wall, that yellow layer around the cell. It's made of a unique substance known as peptidoglycan. It's a carbohydrate protein mix that's unique to bacteria and often the target of antibiotics. And then we have to think about bacterial lifestyle a little bit and say, how do they live? Well, they need to stick to things. And there's a couple features that help them do that. There's this sticky capsule around many of them, not all, but many. And then they also have pili. Both of those help them stick to other substances. And pili also help them to exchange these plasmids, these bits of DNA that are floating around inside the cell, and bacteria can exchange those bits of DNA, which is unique. It's, it's not sexual reproduction like other cells do. It's just exchanging small amounts of DNA. And then finally is the bacterial flagellum. It's a lot like other cells flagella on the surface, but instead of swishing back and forth, it actually rotates. If you look at a diagram of this, here's the cell membrane. Here's one part and the other part, and there's this sort of motor unit in the middle driven by a hydrogen gradient, which is weird. And then it just rotates this hook around, and the whole thing just spins around like a propeller on a boat. That's really strange and definitely unique to uh, bacteria. When bacteria reproduce, they can only do it asexually. Only one parent and all the offspring are identical, they're clones. Because of this simplicity, they can also reproduce really, really fast. And this provides us with some good opportunities, but also some problems as well. Because they multiply so fast, if we don't want them to, we need to slow them down. Now, since bacteria are just a single cell, then when they produce an offspring, that means their population has doubled. And after each of those two produce more offspring, the whole population has doubled again. This results in exponential growth, which looks like this. So if we're looking over time, and the y-axis charts the number of bacteria, even if we only start with a few, population growth starts out kind of slow. You go from 2 to 4 to 8 to 16 to 32, but then it really starts to take off and you get into the millions very quickly. And these guys can double in as little as 20 minutes. So every 20 minutes you're going to double the population. So once you have a million, you go to 2 million really fast. This is part of what's behind the expiration date on things. Now we use bacteria to make sour cream, but when bacteria get too abundant and take over, it tastes kind of gross. And you can smell it, and you can smell all those weird byproducts. So the expiration date is printed there because people know how many bacteria are already in that sour cream container. And if you put it in the refrigerator, the reason you do so is to sort of draw out that curve. Because the cold slows them down, they keep doubling, but they do it slower. And so that's why we refrigerate a lot of foods to slow bacterial growth. Same with the freezer, just slows it down and extends the amount of time that we can keep it before it goes bad.
Some of the practical applications of this insane growth of bacteria is that we need to keep their populations in check because if they get too high, then they start causing some problems. So to bring them back down, we do things like bathing and washing our hands and brushing our teeth. Even using the toilet is getting rid of those excess bacteria in our large intestine. Even a single bacterium that gets into a patient in an open wound um, can really start multiplying and causing problems. So keeping bacterial populations under control is a real challenge, but a necessity. You'll learn a lot more about that when you take microbiology in a few quarters. Pretty safe to say that pretty much anything we can eat, bacteria can eat better. So we're at a constant battle with bacteria. They're always trying to eat our food, aren't they? Things go bad and rot, and that's just bacteria taking over and decomposing them. They're just living life. Now, on the other hand, they can digest things that we just can't. Like I said, they could digest anything we can, but in addition to the complex carbohydrates that we can digest, which are really just glycogen and starch, they can also digest cellulose and chitin, which, remember, make up the cell walls of fungi, exoskeletons of insects, and the plant cell walls. So bacteria have the ability to just wipe out fungi and plants once they fall and, and start decomposing. So uh, they can take care of all that stuff. About the only organic molecule that they can't get into is plastic, which is part of why it's used so extensively. Now I have this here, not just to say that plastic is not edible by bacteria, but to also point out that we use bacteria to actually process our food. Since they're so good at digesting things, we actually use them to pre-digest it for us and also to make it last longer, which sounds strange. So the sour cream I showed earlier, yogurt, these are dairy products which contain lactose. Some people are not tolerant of lactose and, and others are, but if bacteria get in here, they break down the lactose into lactic acid. And that's not a problem for us. It also turns the food acidic, drops the pH and preserves it. It keeps other dangerous bacteria and mold out of here. So it actually keeps our food safe longer. And it doesn't just stop with yogurt, pickles as well. So they've taken the sugars inside of plant cells and turned them into lactic acid, which is the natural pickling process. Um, a lot of pickles are just made by cooking them and putting them in vinegar, but actually even old vinegar is produced by bacteria fermenting those sugars. Bacteria are great fermenters, and they produce all kinds of crazy products, a lot of which smell kind of weird. Uh, and so when you smell vinegar, and it's a vinegar bottle, you think nothing of it. But if you were to pick up a sandwich or something else and it smelled like vinegar, you'd probably throw it away. Those are good indications that something has gone bad, bacteria have taken over, they have fermented and produced these weird smelly products as a result of that. So sometimes it's an advantage, other times it really indicates spoilage, but bacteria ferment lots of things. Bacteria are kind of weird. Unlike us, we need oxygen. A lot of bacteria are harmed by oxygen, and so they're natural fermenters. They break down food differently than we do and produce all those strange, smelly, uh, off products. Actually, even BO is a byproduct of bacteria. Actually, maybe this is encouraging. If you have BO, you, it's not you that smell, it's your bacteria. When we sweat from our armpits, actually a lot of protein is produced in that sweat. Not the sweat on your forehead, but in your armpits, it is. And it's bacteria breaking down those proteins and fermenting that create those weird smells. Another good example of it. There's a group of bacteria that are also really important to plant life. I'll illustrate it here. It's called rhizobium. They live inside of plant roots. You can see the little specks there. And inside there, the plants feed them sugars, the bacteria ferment, and then they turn nitrogen from the air into ammonia, which fertilizes the plants. So a lot of plants are fertilized by bacteria. Really interesting relationship there, and an important one to plant life on Earth. Well, speaking of plant life, I forgot to add photosynthesis to the list. 
some bacteria photosynthesize. They're called cyanobacteria. So they live right alongside other algae creating foods using the energy from the sun. Bacteria, can't live with them, can't live without them, like I said at the beginning. So from food processing to food spoilage, from photosynthesis to decomposition, bacteria do it all. And what they lack in interesting appearance, they really make up for in an interesting lifestyle. I hope you will really look forward to taking microbiology in the future. Hopefully this has just piqued your interest and uh, learning a little more about these amazing creatures that are very important to human health. Until next time, keep appreciating life.